Kip, what's going on, man? Great to see you today. Looking forward to our questions. I know anytime we field questions from, uh, from the Iron Council, I know they're going to be solid. You know, but even, even saying that, the questions that have come from outside of the Iron Council have also been more solid lately. Have you noticed that? I have. I have. I think they finally caught on that we're filtering out bad questions. And so those have stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or we know they'll know we'll make fun of them. And so there's <laughs> I was I was actually talking about this because we had legacy event this last weekend. And we we were talking about peer pressure with the young men. I don't call them boys, I call them young men. I think that's imp an important distinction. And yeah. and I asked them all generally, I said, is peer pressure bad? You know, a lot of them said yes, peer pressure is bad. But I actually contended that. And I said, not necessarily. It depends on who's giving you the pressure, right? Because we all yeah. know the phrase iron the pressure sharpens iron. pressure to do what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we know the phrase iron sharpens iron. So if the pressure is good coming from the right place, from the right people, that peer pressure is actually a very powerful thing. There's men in my life, whether they're coaches or mentors, either directly or indirectly, or you or guys in the Iron Council who put some pressure on me to perform in a meaningful and significant way. So peer pressure is not inherently bad. It's who's doing the pressure and what, like you said, they're pressuring you to do. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And a quick update because it's, it's bound to be a question for everybody. If we, we posted this anywhere else, I assume the event was awesome. I saw tons of photos on Instagram at Ryan Mickler, Gatchko posted some stuff. It looks like the event was a, just a huge success. Yeah, it was awesome. It was our first uh, father-son event here. We did one other event here. When I say here, I'm talking about my my property Maine. here in Maine. Yeah, uh, and and it was it was awesome. The guys stayed uh, in our barn. We had bunk beds lined out, almost like military barracks. You'll see when you come out for our main event. <laughs> yeah, and it it just turned out so good. Uh, and I've I've actually got a list because I talk with you guys a lot about doing after action reviews. I do the same thing. I'm not telling you to do anything yeah. I wouldn't do. So I've got a list for Thursday, a list for Friday, a list for Saturday, uh, last of night, your AARs for each day, everything I need to do to change it and tweak it and adjust it and what I need to do. And then last night after the event was over, I was exhausted, just mentally, not, not physically exhausted, but mentally and emotionally, which is sometimes more taxing. Yeah. Uh, and I just spent time or I spent probably $3,000 last night in ordering new merchandise, new supplies, new this, new that, just to make it a better experience next time we do it. So I love it. I love that constant feedback and figuring out how we can improve and make it better. And so the next couple of events, it's looking like we're probably going to be doing every year moving forward. The, the legacy will be the last weekend of September. So just get that on your radar right now, just guys. Kind of as a standard. Got yeah. It. Yeah. That way everybody knows last weekend of September, there's only 20 spots. I'm sure the guys that came this time are probably going to fill up at least half of those, I would imagine. So we'll let you know when the rest of the dates are out, which will be in the next two weeks. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we mentioned this already. We're fielding questions from the Iron Council, uh, which is our exclusive brotherhood. To learn more about the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Shall we jump right into it? Let's do it, man. Let's get after it. All right. All right. First question, Nolan uh, Connell. Uh, this is derived from this week's topic. This is a very first question asked and is very impactful. <laughs> the follow-up questions are what, come, what came from the discussions within my team. I would like to see what you and Kip have to say on this topic. Are you free? What does freedom look like to you? What steps can you take to become free? Is it a state of being or a mindset that you must constantly evaluate. So what Nolan is referring to is the monthly topic in the Iron Council, creating your new reality, which is the topic of the month for September. Uh, so he's asking what, what is free? I, look, very, very simply, freedom is the ability to, it's hard because I have to answer this generally, but freedom yeah. is the ability to do what you want, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, why you want to do it, period. That's it. Yeah. And if you're not able to do any of that, what you want to do or how you want to do it or why you want to do it or when you want to do it, then you're not truly free. So is it a state of being? I mean, it's partly mindset for sure, yeah. but that's not it. 
because you might say, well, I'm free. And yet you've subjugated yourself to your wife or your boss or your kids or your colleagues or your coworkers or your clients. I'll give you a great example from clients. Real estate agents are a prime example. A lot of them say, well, you know, I have to meet on nights and weekends, but I don't want to do that. Okay. So are you really free? Yeah. No, you're not. Now, if you want to, that's one thing. But if you're saying to me, I don't want to meet my clients on yeah. nights and weekends. You're and yet that's the only it. Yeah. yeah, then you're not yeah. really free. And people say, well, that's just the way the real estate market is. Are you sure? Why Who not says? change the market? Yeah. Why not change the market? Why not get so yeah. busy that if somebody comes and so good at your job, that if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I only have this Saturday. I say, sorry, I don't do Saturdays. And they say, well, oh, we really want to work with you. Would you do the Thursday at, at three o'clock? Yeah, absolutely. But not Saturday at 10. That, and, and I know all you real estate agents are rolling over in your graves right now. Like, oh, hey, my head's about to explode, Ryan. You don't understand. No, I get it. I understand. Because I was in the financial services market for a uh, business for almost 10 years. And that was standard. Like you meet on nights and weekends. I didn't, I did it early on because I didn't know any better and I didn't have the clientele. But later I said, no, you, you want to meet and work with me? You work within my parameters. And if you don't, that's okay. I got 10 people lined up who will work within my parameters. But that comes with that. That is what freedom is. And I didn't want to work nights and I didn't want to work weekends. When I was in retail, I didn't want to work on the weekends. I didn't want to work holidays. And so I told my wife, I said, no, I'm not going back to retail when I come back to Iraq because from Iraq, because I don't want to work nights and weekends. And I made the choice. Now, it was hard because I left a good job and something that was meaningful, something I enjoyed. But I would rather have the life I want than just chase the dollar or whatever. People will email me quite often, actually, and say, hey, you know, Ryan, I'd love to have you on my podcast. And I try to be very gracious in doing that and say, yes, I, 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 would, I would like to come on your podcast. And they'll say, well, you know, I'm just doing this part-time. Can you do Thursday at 7 p.m.? No but I can do Thursday at 3 p.m. Oh, well, I can't because I'm working. Take a lunch break. That's on you. That's not on me. Yeah. And 90% of the time, at the point I'm at now, these guys will say, okay, yeah, I'll change my schedule. Yeah, right. You will change your schedule. I will not change my schedule. And that's what freedom is. I'm free because I've built it to the point, specifically within this business, where I don't need to do that. Now, there would be some people I would do that for. If yeah. Joe Rogan called and said, hey, Ryan, we want you on the podcast and you need to be here Friday evening at midnight, I would be there Friday evening at midnight. <laughs> but that's a choice that I make, a deliberate and intentional choice. I would not feel forced to do that. I would weigh the pros and the cons. I would weigh the cost and the sacrifice. And that's a choice I would make. Yeah. But that's what freedom is. It's making those yeah. conscious decisions. There's also another question that came up later down because I looked through the thre thread of questions about sovereignty yeah. and God. And I actually really am interested in addressing that question because it actually ties into what we're talking about here. Agreed. We have a couple of biblical questions. It, let me run this by you, Ryan, because I, I was, uh, this is months ago, maybe even a year ago or two, where I was thinking about freedom and how from on the flip side of this, how we try to rob people of their freedom in our relationships a little bit. So let me give you an example where I don't, I, I, I might manipulate you to make a decision, or if you don't do what I think you should do, I withhold myself and I'm an ass and you know what I mean? And we, we manipulate people and we kind of rob them a little, don't get me wrong. They still have their choice, but it's interesting on how we try to take away those freedoms from people as well and course them into doing what we think they should or should not do. Yeah. So here's another interesting conversation we had this weekend with the fathers and the young men. We were talking about responsibility and, and what we were addressing. I can't remember the exact topic we were, we were, we were covering, but it, responsibility came up and Normally, when we look at responsibility, we try to divvy up percentages like, oh, 50% goes to Kip because of this podcast and 50% goes to me, right? To make this a good podcast. Got it. But the, yeah. but the response, because you're half and I'm half of it, but the responsibility pie isn't finite. So yeah. actually, Kip, 
you don't have 50% responsibility of this. You know how much responsibility you have over this particular podcast? What would you say? Over our AMA? Yes. Well, it depends. Like if, if you said, hey, I'm out today, then I think, okay, my responsibility is 100%. I got to make sure that the recording goes good, that I get the files to whoever for this episode. But right? what, if I, what if I'm available? What about this one today? What responsibility do you have for this podcast? I don't know. Like, I mean, part of me feels like I should have extreme ownership, right. And come to the table and go, Hey, if Ryan's not on at, at our scheduled time, I should be reach out and like actually take and be driven to make sure it occurs. Okay. So you give know? me a percentage. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'll tell you what I, what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what you think. Because the responsibility pie isn't finite. You have a hundred percent responsibility for this podcast. Hmm. Whether I show up or not, you have a hundred percent responsibility to make sure this thing goes well. Yeah. And how much responsibility do I have to make sure this thing goes well? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a marriage. It ain't 50, yeah. 50. It's a hundred, a hundred. Yeah. My wife has a hundred percent responsibility for our marriage. I have a hundred percent responsibility for our marriage. The responsibility so, pie guys is not finite. It, it, you, you have to have a hundred percent responsibility for everything that you've decided to go in on. And you so might Ryan, say, me, well, you know, Ryan, but like I have these outside factors. I have this team member who's not doing what he should be doing. Okay. Well, that's your responsibility. That's not your fault. Maybe he dropped the ball, but you could be damn sure that is your responsibility. Now, yeah, if, totally, if, totally. if you're on a team and let's say there's five people uh, that are working on this, you might say, well, it's 20% of each of us. And I'm only a component of this. And you notice Joe over here dropping the ball. Do you only worry about your 20%? Hell no. You're a hundred percent in, or you're not in. This is a go, no go exercise, meaning you're all in or all out pick, but yeah. none of this yeah. 15, 20, 30, 50%. No, a hundred percent or nothing. And you're going to be better, man. You're going to add so much more value. People are going to look at you as valuable. You're going to, your relationships are going to be more significant. You're going to get promotions. You're going to lead businesses. You're going to pick up new clients hundred percent in all things. Let me ask you this, Ryan, because it was just present for me as you're asking this question. Um, it, and I, I could see, I, I get it. I have an easier time comprehending that approach of kind of extreme ownership when something goes wrong, <laughs> you know, it's like, Hey, own it. Look for these areas in which you could have, you could step up and have influence. And what could you change to help mitigate those concerns or whatever? How do you address this from the perspective of not wanting to step on someone's toes? Cause that actually crossed my mind for a minute, right? It was, well, I could say hundred percent, but I don't want Ryan to think that like, that I'm trying to control quote unquote yes. the podcast, right. Or you know what I'm right. saying? But again, you're, what you're saying right now is looking at it from a finite perspective. Okay. What you're mm -hmm. saying, let's just take a pie. All right. Imagine a pie and the pie is a whole, right? We know that from math. It's one over one. It's whole. Yeah. And finite means that we all divvy up shares of that pie based on what we think our weight of the responsibility is. So if there's two of us, maybe it's 70, 30 or 50, 50 or whatever. And then that equals one that equals the whole that's a finite approach. Okay. And so what I'm telling you to do is look at it as an infinite pie, meaning there's no end. There's no beginning. It's infinite. So you have a hundred percent. I have a hundred percent. And you might look at that and say, well, that equals 200%. That's not right. Yes, it is because it's fine. It's infinite, not finite. But the same is true if things go wrong and you're like, well, I don't want to step on toes. You're doing the same thing. You're playing a finite game. You're saying that, Ryan, mm -hmm. if I take responsibility for this, I'm taking away from you. Well, but it's, uh, but it's, not, a, it's not a finite pie. Yeah. It's an infinite pie. So if you take 100%, are you taking anything from me? No, because it's infinite. No. Yeah. So th there's no level of responsibility. Here's another way to look at it. A lot of people will shit on other people who are successful and, and, and they'll try to drag them down because they think, they believe that if that person's successful, then I can't be. That's a finite game. It's infinite. If somebody else is successful, that doesn't take away from my ability to be successful. 
if there was only 12 slices of pie or pizza and Kip, you grab six, there's only six left. And I got to get my six. And that's how a lot of people address life. But that isn't actually how it works. When you are successful, you're paving the way for me to be more successful. It's an infinite yeah. game. So when people say, well, I don't want to step on people's toes. What, like what a inferior way to look at life. Now, yeah, granted, there's we're... tactics and there's strategy yeah, understood. and there's the way that you do things. I'm not going to step all over my boss because I need a hundred percent of the credit. That's not what I'm saying, guys. I'm yeah. saying take a hundred percent responsibility. And here's another, here's another consideration. When things go really, really well and they work out, you don't need to brag about, I got a hundred percent. Now it's like, Hey guys, look what we did. Yeah. And if you're bragging, you're getting into the, the finite game because what you're yeah, saying when you, you think brag, it's you and not this, I yeah. did all of this, but you didn't do it yeah. all. Cause it's infinite. Yeah. So there's the finite game and there's the infinite game and mm -hmm. it goes, whether you're successful or fall behind or stepping on people's toes or being humble or whatever, finite and infinite. What game are you playing? Got it. Rob Phipps. Do you, either of you do Wim Hof breathing or cold exposure? If so, have you noticed improvements in recovery performance and physical activities such as Brazilian jiu-jitsu, weight training, and et cetera? I don't know if I, so I do this actually quite a bit. And I don't know if I would say, well, Wim Hof breathing or cold exposure has made me better at jiu-jitsu. I don't, I don't know that I would link it directly to that or has made me stronger. I don't think it would. But from a recovery perspective and the way that I feel and the mental benefits and the stimulation that come from it, 100%. But it yeah. would be hard for me to directly correlate my improvement in jujitsu or strength with me taking cold baths or cold showers. Like, I don't, I don't know yeah. that I could directly correlate that, correlate that. But that's one of the exercises we did this weekend with fathers and young men's. And I jumped in. I wasn't planning on doing it because I was moderating everything. But I told guys, I said, look, as a leader, you never ask people to do things you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. And so I, I, I jumped in the ice bath and I wasn't planning on doing it, but I felt like that was a good learning opportunity in the moment. So I jumped in and I did exactly what I asked of them. In fact, I did more. I told them to sit in there for two minutes. I sat in there for three minutes because yeah. you leaders, we always go first. That's what you have to do. If you want to lead and you want to be inspiring and everything to other people. So when I got out and this has been the experience every time I've gotten to a cold ice bath or a cold shower is it's almost euphoric in a way. Yeah. I just feel very calm. I feel very centered. Um, I know I sleep very, very well. I actually get super warm. My body, I can feel the temperature of my body get very, very warm. And, and I just, I feel like I perform better. The little aches and pains and joint issues and things that I have, they tend to dissipate over that afternoon or that evening. I feel clear, clear, mentally clear and focused. So there's a lot of benefits and I'm not even talking about the physical benefits that are easy to, to quantify, like stimulated fat loss and regulating the parasympathetic nervous system. All of these, this data and research we have behind cold exposure and breathing you can go research that. That's scientific. You can measure that. I'm talking about the mental effects and benefits. I don't know that they directly improve those things, but they certainly contribute to it for me anyways. Yeah, for sure. Does, is box breathing part of Wim Hof's breathing technique? Uh, it's, I, I don't know that he would call it box breathing. Cause he's saying box breathing, the way you're, you're saying it, Mark, Mark Devine's concept, I think is four seconds in four second hold, four second out, four second hold, four yeah. second in, right? Yeah. And Wim no. Hof doesn't do that exact breathing. Okay. Similar concepts, whereas, you know, deep breaths, controlled. there's, all, there's also yeah. controlled breaths. There's also an element of uh, almost hyperventilation, which is hyper oxygenating the blood. So it's not really, it's not box breathing, but there are strategies incorporated mm -hmm. into his breathing techniques that are supposed to oxygenate the oxygenate the blood, help your lung capacity, improve functions of the parasympathetic, including your ability to control the parasympathetic nervous system. But, but it's not box breathing. It's different than that. I see. Got it. I was going to say, I, I actually box breathe at nighttime when I'm, when I'm in bed, 
trying to like clear my mind and go to sleep. And that actually yeah. really helps me like kind of relax, you know? So, but honestly, I used to think that stuff was stupid. Yeah. Even, even cold exposure. Like, this is stupid. This is dumb. And, and there's these, these, uh, what are they biohackers who geek out on all this stuff and they go through all the little ins and outs and intricacies. I'm like, that is a freaking waste of time. <laughs> You're focused on like the minute, like focus on the macro and the micro stuff will take care of itself. Like just eat right. You know, people are like, oh, diet, keto, uh, uh, intermittent fasting and like all these different kind of diets. I'm like, you, everybody knows what to eat. Just eat right. Yeah. And that has been my mentality of, well, well, should you do this hit or should you do strength training? I don't care. Well, tell me this. Here's what we ran into in the financial planning practice. Hey, Ryan, uh, uh, can you show me a, a, the mutual fund that performed the best over, you know, the last 10 years? Cause right now I'm getting a 5.5% rate of return on average. And if you can show me one that does 6.7, then I will invest in that. And then my next question is, well, tell me how much you're investing right now. Oh, well, I'm not investing anything. <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't really matter what mutual fund you invest in if you're not actually investing any money. And this is what people do. And I know why they do it. This is exactly why they do it. They do it because they think the research phase is some sort of movement of the needle. Like, well, if I'm yeah. researching and I'm, and I can tell people I'm intermittent I'm fasting, and I'm trying to figure it out. I'm yeah. making progress. No, you're not. You're thinking about making progress. It, it's like this. You're on a racetrack. And you're going to race a, a vehicle. You're going to do a, a quarter mile and you're going to race another vehicle next to you. Is revving the engine actually part of the race? Like yeah. when you rev the engine, but it's not in gear, are you winning the race? I mean, it might sound really good. Your car might sound awesome, but you're actually not moving anywhere. So you're not winning the race. And that's yeah. what people do with information. It's like consume, consume, including this podcast. Oh, well, I listened to every, all 850 of Order Men podcasts. And I read every single book that Jocko wrote. And I watched all of his videos on Monday. And I, and I say, well, cool. Tell me how your life's better over the 12 months. Well, actually, you know, I'm a little worse. Like I gained a few more pounds and been a little bit more lazy. But, but, I, but I really like this stuff. Okay. Now you're just in it for entertainment factor. You're not actually in it for the improvement of yourself. Yeah, that's funny. It, it, it reminds me of, so I did a cycling race with my wife just like three weeks ago and I don't have clip-ons. So I just have cages for my shoes. And, mm -hmm. and he's just like, you're going to be the only guy riding a bike without, without clip-ons. Right. Cause all the cyclists have these, you know, special shoes and pedals. And, and what I told her was honey, in the grand scheme of things, the shoes and by which I'm attached my feet to the pedals is the least of my problems, right? Yes, like I'm like, that's exactly right. You know, what I need to focus on is my, my muscles endurance and my ability to do this for a long period of time. That is my focus. I'll worry about the, the step-ins later. I'll worry about being more aerodynamic and, you know, these other things, because in the grand scheme of thing, you know, that that's going to be a smaller needle later on that, that is not really on my radar. Right. I, I just need to be able to survive, you know, physically. So, well, but, if yeah. I would, the only, and the only way I would contend with it, what you just said is if you're going to run, if you're going to race the tour de France, but you're not, yeah, yeah. you're, or, you're on a, yeah, you're or, on a hundred mile bike ride with your wife. Yeah. You want to be competitive. Sure. Of course. And do your best, but you're not, you're not running the tour de France. Like you're totally. And, and maybe I want to fine tune, right? Maybe my next, next goal is, Hey, I want to finish this thing two hours faster. Okay. And I'm, I've now take, I've addressed the low hanging fruit. Now let's, you know, look at these other areas to fine tune, but like why right. fine tune something when I'm at the very entry level of, of expertise into something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because so. it's the only reason you would do that is because you think you're moving the needle and you're not. Well, it's the old adage. Yeah. Would you rather have, if you could choose one or the other, would you rather have the skill set or the tools? Mm. Of course. You'd yeah. always rather have the skill set. Yeah. Always. A hundred percent. Yeah. The tools, yeah. the tools are, are important. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying if you could only choose, and that's a false dichotomy, I know, but for this, for the sake of this exercise, the skill sets are better than the tools. And then you develop and hone the skill set. And then you start to tweak and adjust and improve and level up the, the, the tools. 
And, and that stuff, you can, you can always take care of that. I told the, again, I told the young men this weekend is like, you can, you can always learn the skills. Like I can teach you skills. I can teach you how to organize. I can teach you how to plan out your day. I can teach you a lot of these things. What I can't teach is heart. What I can't teach is assertiveness, is caring about other people. I can't teach that stuff. But if you have that, that makes all the difference because I can teach all that other stuff. Easy day. Yeah. But I can't teach some of those things. Yeah. Okay. Michael Lutfi, how does Christian faith conflict with sovereignty as a man? As a Christians, uh, we are sub, we submit to the authority and the will of God, but some of the Iron Council message is we are makers of our own destiny and we forge our own path in life. Just feels that there needs to be a hierarchy of authority. However, that hierarchy is not the excuse or, to, or as a cop-out. Maybe that is the answer to my question. We are to forge our way under the authority and will of God. So I... This question is one that gets brought up all the time. Yeah. And I, frankly, I don't understand the question. I don't, I understand the question. I don't understand where the hangup is. That's the point I'm making. Okay. Agreed. It's, it, it used the, you started this question with how does it conflict with? It doesn't yeah. at all. Yeah. Cause what is one of the greatest gifts? Let's just talk about Christianity for a minute. And I only talk about Christianity because that's what I know. There's probably other faiths that believe very much the same way. Let's talk about Christianity. One of the greatest blessings, the gifts that we have been bestowed with is free will, is personal agency, is the ability to choose our own path, to determine right or wrong, to make our own choices. Now, that doesn't free us of the consequences of those choices, but we have been blessed with the gift to decide for ourselves. Because if this wasn't the case, there would need be no purpose for this life. Because yeah. the purpose of this life is to learn and to grow and to develop and to get better and to improve and then to return to him and help other people do the same. That's, the, that's why we're here, to be tested. And if you had no personal agency, there would be no test. Yeah, what's the point? Exactly. There's no point to being here. So God in his infinite wisdom said, I will give you personal agency. And then what you do with that is going to determine your destiny. And look, here's the deal. I can be a sovereign man and choose to follow God's path. I don't have to. There's an infinite number of decisions I can make on a daily basis that deviate from his path. And sometimes I do deviate from his path, frankly, like all of us do. Those are my choices. But I haven't relinquished sovereignty because I personally decide to follow a path. Let me break this down on a more secular approach. Let's say you came to me and you said, you know, Ryan, I'm 50 pounds overweight and I really want to lock in my diet, my nutrition and my fitness. And I said, well, cool. Uh, Why don't you go talk with uh, my friend Josiah Novak? He's a health and fitness coach. Go hire him. He's going to help you get things locked in. And you say, great, I'm going to do that. So you call up Josiah and he says, "Uh, yeah, I can certainly help you out. It's going to be uh, $200 a month. That's arbitrary. I'm just throwing out a number. So don't don't quote me on that. (laughs) Otherwise he might be mad (laughs) or happy. I don't know, depending on what he does. Okay. So he says $200 a month and you say, okay, yeah, that that sounds fair. Um, All right. Yeah, let's do it. You give me a nutrition plan and you give me a workout plan. Uh, and then I'm going to follow it. Do you feel inferior because you hired a coach and he gives you a plan for fitness and nutrition and you follow it? Do you feel, frankly, do you feel like, like your bitch? freedom is taken away? Do yeah. you feel like you're yeah. inferior? Do you feel inadequate? Do you feel like you're not in control of your own destiny? Of course you don't feel like that. That sounds stupid. I know. Because you've purposely, intentionally made the decision to follow somebody who has some things figured out. You look at Josiah, he's got things on lock, man. He's fit. He's got a lovely wife. He's got a beautiful family. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a thriving business. He's fit. He's healthy. He feels good. And you, and you want to be like that. I, I want to be like that. Yeah. I don't feel inferior or inadequate or, or subject to Josiah because I asked him to help me with my fitness stuff. 
But why do we do that in the same context of spirituality? I don't feel inferior because I've voluntarily chosen to walk a particular path that I've decided to fi- uh, follow the path of morality, that I've decided to be disciplined, to uh, limit exposure to certain activities and behaviors and substances. And I've decided to embrace going to church and following in his footsteps. I don't feel, I don't feel inadequate. I don't feel like I gave anything up. This, by the way, guys, the, the same guys who say, well, is there any conflict between sovereignty and Christianity are the same guys who wear the discipline equals freedom t-shirt. Okay, well, so if, if we're taking your logic, then this discipline, adherence to a set of behaviors and patterns and thoughts, limit your sovereignty? Is that what you're saying? No, of course it doesn't, because you voluntarily you're decided deciding. to be disciplined. Yeah. Yeah. No so guys, let's get over the, you. let's get over. And they do the same thing with stoicism. Let's get over the, Hey, the yeah. sovereignty conflicts with, I'm not saying that you're in charge of everything. I'm saying you're in charge of yourself. And you know what, if I was sitting here having a conversation with God right now and knock on wood, I don't want to have that conversation today. Cause that means I'm dead. <laughs> but if I'm sitting, having that conversation with God right now, and I said, Hey, does, uh, individual sovereignty conflict with your beliefs. And he would say, that's actually in exact alignment because I sent you here to have a mortal body so that you could decide for yourself. I gave you freedom and autonomy over your thoughts and your mind and your body. I want you to make the right decisions, but that choice is yours. And then you have to live with the consequences of the decisions that you make. And I would love, and I'm speaking from his perspective, I would love for you to make the correct, the right, the righteous, the choices that are going to serve you and other people well. But ultimately, those are your decisions to make. And, and it's not a when conflict. you make bad decisions, I have a great system in place called the atonement. I'll help you out. There's a way to grow from one's mistakes, but still a decision you have to make. Yep. Yeah. I think I wonder why alignment. this comes. I think this, I wonder if this comes from the fact that that some people their religion, they, they were never converted to the religion that they, they are part of. Meaning I believe this because this is the way I was raised and they've never took on that ownership of their religious beliefs as their own and took it as something that has been given to them. And they've never stopped and paused and said, is this in alignment with what I want to do, or is this, and making a a conscious decision versus just cultural social pressures or, or whatever. Well, at the risk of assuming, I would say to back up what you're saying, that it's a lack of testimony. Yeah. Right. You're relying on, well, some, my mom and dad and social pressure or something else. Yeah. Yeah. And so your, your testimony has not been tested. Uh, and, and, and you're not entire again, I'm assuming here, but, but I think it stems from a lack of powerful testimony. You know, like I, yeah. I believe that there are some things that are good and some things that are bad and some things that work well, some things that don't. And I try to move towards the things that work well and the things that m- move away from the things that don't. And those are choices I'm making. But when I make right decisions, I don't think, oh, well, gosh, I made that right decision and something turned out well. So like my sovereignty must be limited. What the hell? Like, how do you come to that conclusion? Yeah. It's very interesting. They're no, they're the answer yeah. is no, they're not in conflict. They're very much in alignment. Yeah. All right. Steven Giov- Giovanali, man. I'm sorry, Steven in the iron <laughs> council, Stephen G Stephen I, G I, Stephen G. I feel sorry. Like iron council guys, I should definitely be pronouncing your names correctly. So Stephen G how long did it take, uh, take for you to trust that everything would get done? Example, I schedule my days in a week, but find myself thinking I should be doing task X as much as possible instead of reading 10 pages or working out. Thanks for all you do. I'm having a hard time following this, this question. Maybe you, maybe, maybe a little bit, that. but I, I think I kind of get the gist of it. Well, my answer is I, I've never, I've, I'm not there yet. Like you, you say, how long did it take for you to believe everything was going to get done? I actually, I'm not there. I don't, I don't know that everything will get done. Is this trusting the plan? Is that what he's kind of saying? 
Yeah, I think he's saying, I, I think okay. if I, if I were to interpret this question, what I would say is, you know, if, if I'm going to be doing the plan, is it going to work out and are things going to get accomplished to the degree that I want them to? Um, yeah. That's how I interpret that. The answer is I, I don't know. Yeah. Like I really don't know when I, when I, let's say, a, let's say an event and, and I'll give you an example from our history of, of order of man. When I launched our first event, uh, I, 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 set it up. I called a, a lodge in Southern Utah that I wanted to have up in the mountain. And I put a, put a bunch of money on this, this lodge to secure the reservation for the dates that I had planned. And then once I had it reserved, then I went into my Facebook group and the podcast and I tried to get people to sign up for it. Guess how many people signed up? You know, the story. Kid. How, yeah. Not how a many single people person were in the Facebook group at that time. Uh, I think it was about a thousand if I had to make an educated guess. Yeah. So I, I I would have, I mean, you have a thousand members to pull from. I would have assumed, you know what I mean? That you would have gotten. Right. I think that would be a safe assumption that you'd have a number of people sign up. Somebody, somebody would have signed up. You would think Yeah. the iron council was going, I had people in the iron council. Like you would have think somebody would have signed up. Yeah. No, not a single soul signed up. Not one guys. (laughs) And then I. I, I reached out to the, the lodge and I said, Hey, you know, nobody signed up. He's like, Oh, that sucks. I said, yeah, it does suck. He's like, you're going to lose your deposit. <laughs> like, thank you. Set, uh, set expectations. Yeah. yeah. And, and I said, well, hold up, hold on, hold on. And this is where the salesman and me came out. And I said, yeah, what, what, what can you work with me? Like, what if we bumped it back three or four months uh, and you keep my deposit and you just apply it in three or four months to, to what we're going to do. He's like, I will do that. He was very nice. He says, I will do that, but you'll be in, in peak season. So it will be a little bit more expensive, but I'll take your deposit and I will apply it to that because he didn't have anybody that wanted to book that weekend. So he's being very nice. And I said, great, thank that. I'll take it deal. And I went back to the drawing board and I figured out my messaging and I released the second attempt at an event. And we had 20 guys, I had 20 spots. We had 20 guys show up. And we called our, we call ourselves still to this day, the terrible 20. And I have a picture, a black and white picture from 2016, I believe it is of us, the terrible 20 in my, in my barn on the wall, it's framed, it's black and white. It's really cool to pay homage to the guys, the 20 guys who believed in these events before you really had the right to believe in what it is we were doing. Yeah. But I didn't know it'd work out. And when we did legacy this past weekend, I didn't know that it would work out. And when I reach out to somebody I want to have on the podcast or a podcast I want to join, I don't, I don't actually know if it's going to work out. Or when we come up with a new t-shirt or hat design, I really don't know if it's going to work out. Now I have feedback where it's like, okay, well, we have a black hat with a brown leather patch and they sell really well. So what if I did a gray with black and a, you know, lighter tan patch? Okay, odds are it's probably going to sell because I have some feedback to base it on, but I don't know until I put it out there. And one of the lessons I taught these young men this weekend was that life is a process of experimentation, but too many men, what they do is they play their lives for keeps, meaning every decision is catastrophic. Yeah. Like Ryan, what if I start this new business and it's, and then uh, I get fired because they find out and then I don't have enough clients. And then I go, I default on my mortgage. And then my wife thinks I'm a loser and she divorces me. And then she speaks badly about me in front of my kids. And then my kids hate me. Uh, and then my dog dies. And then like all this stuff, right? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up a second. All you're saying is you're going to start a podcast. <laughs> like it's <laughs> just chill. Do you think they really believe that though? Or do you think that's, that's, that's yes, I, they believe that, Kip. They believe okay. it. And I know they believe it because I believe that stuff still to this day. There's a term. It's a psychological term. And it's 100% true, Kip. They're okay. not deceiving thinking, themselves. They're just making excuses no. like, oh, why I mean, they maybe, do it? Sure, maybe yeah. there's some excuses. But there's a term. It's called cognitive distortion. And 100% they believe it. And I know because I believe it in cognitive distortion, please, gentlemen, look it up. Cognitive distortion is distorting reality and blowing things out of proportion so 
far beyond proportion that any sane, rational human being outside of the emotional baggage that you have would never believe the conclusion you just drew. And we do it because biologically we're hardwired to do it, to thrive, to stay alive. So we think about the worst possible scenario so that we can keep ourselves alive as a species. Let me give you a very small example. It sounds stupid when I say it. Well, so, I, but it's, but it's real. So my yeah. wife and I, when we went through our separation and there's been a thousand other scenarios, but this is a good one. My wife and I went through our separation, uh, roughly 12 or so years ago. And it was a very hard time for me. It, it was like the, it was not like it was the darkest time in my life. It was very, very difficult for me. I called her one day to, to talk about the kid or her whatever. Like I just, I called her and it went to her voicemail. And up until that point, her voicemail said, Hey, you've reached Ryan and Trisha, or you've reached the Micklers, leave a message. We'll call you back. I call her phone. It goes to her voicemail and it says she had changed it. It it wasn't, Hey, you reached the Micklers. It it wasn't, you've reached Ryan and Trisha. It was like, hello, this is Trisha Mickler. Please leave me a message and I'll call you back. And my whole world like shattered in that silly, stupid moment. She, she, she might as well have said, this is Trisha, almost single. Leave exactly. me a message. <laughs> You're laughing, but that's true, man. Well, I, I am laughing because I, have rela- I can relate. Yeah. Anybody in this scenario has gone through this. So I'm freaking out. Like sh- this is over. She wants a divorce. She's moved along. All of these weird thoughts that go through my head. And I vividly remember this conversation. And this is when it kind of like snapped for me. I called her later that evening or the next day or two or whatever. And we were talking and I remember asking her, I said, Hey, it sounds like you changed your voicemail. You know, what's up? And she said this, I will never forget it. It's as vivid as, as, as it was 12 years ago. She said, Oh yeah, I changed it because we're running the uh, Rotary Easter car show. And I wanted people to know that they were calling the right person, that it was me, Trisha, and that they need to leave a message and uh, they needed to get with me specifically. So I didn't want it to have like the family voicemail system on there. That's it. Yeah. That's all it was. And you know what? I actually, I was, the cognitive distortions are so real. I'm going to sound like a freaking psycho. The cognitive distortions are so real that like a week or two later, when I called her back, I wanted to see if she had changed it back. I'm like, well, is, is that really real? Is it, oh, she's just yeah. saying that. Then she didn't really believe that. Like, she's just making that as an excuse. I called it expecting fully that it would say, this is Trisha Mickler. And guess what it said? This is the Micklers. Leave a message. We'll get back with you. Yeah. Guys. We are mental. I would say retarded, but apparently we're not supposed to say that term anymore in the politically <laughs> correct society. So I'll just say mental. We are mental. All of us, you, me, Kip, every one of us are mental. We're mental basket cases. So when you asked me whether or not we really believe that, oh, hell yes, we believe it. Yes. Yeah. And you need to be aware of what the cognitive distortions are and what your mind is doing. Cause it is playing tricks on you a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And that's usually tied to a, a preconceived notion or a story about yourself. And you're just running yourself. around looking for evidence, evidence narcissistic. Of that is true. Yeah. It's narcissistic because again, it's your evolutionary hardwiring teaching you to stay alive. You're, you only care about yourself in that moment. Like, for example, when you're, um, I talked with a gentleman years ago, he got attacked by a bear. His name is Todd or he got attacked by a bear. Uh, and, and, uh, like literally attacked, like take, like depleted, like taken off the ground by a bear and the bear was attacking. Yeah. Do you think in that moment he was saying, Oh, you know, I really forgot to take the trash out, uh, and really honor my wife by, uh, taking care of that chore that I meant to do this morning. Or, you know, my client, oh, damn, that client that I was supposed to talk with, uh, I, you know, I never called them back. Oh, man, I'm such a dick. No, of course not. 
he was worried about staying alive in that moment. Now he might say, oh, my wife, look, I've talked with guys, Braxton McCoy, a good friend of mine. Uh, he went through a horrific situation in Iraq when we were over there and he almost died. Uh, Kyle Carpenter, youngest living Medal of Honor recipient, almost died on the battlefield. And both of them said to me that one of the thoughts that went through their mind is my mom, how is my mom going to handle this? So that's a very selfless mm -hmm. thought in a moment where you think you're going to die, but you're not remembering the minutia about your day-to-day -day activity. You're remember like, what's the biggest threat? There's a bear on my back. I got to figure this out. And then I can worry about taking the trash out or calling that client, but this is the deal right now. So it's very yeah. narcissistic. It's, it's very focused on you, which, okay. In the right scenario is probably the right approach, but not always. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Brad Rigney, when interviewing an accountant for your small business, what are some of the key questions that you would ask? What other, who, what other clients do you work with? How long have you been doing this? What do you enjoy about this work? That's one a lot of people wouldn't ask. What do you enjoy about this? Why do yeah. you like- I hate this. I hate this kind of work. I <laughs> dredge coming into the office. Being an accountant yeah. sucks. Yeah, yeah, don't hire that guy. <laughs> uh, here's another question I would ask. What strategies do business owners often overlook? Like what, what little strategies or little nuances or tricks do you have that most business owners overlook? Like I yeah. want to know he's innovative. Um, how, how aggressive are you with looking for deductions? <laughs> that, that's totally. important. Like, are you that's super the most important question and yeah. you're following everything or are you going to help me figure out where that line is and tiptoe on that? I want to dance on that line. Like I want to waltz yeah. all over that line of what's, you know, not only moral and ethical, but what's legal as well. Like I want to walk yeah. all over that line. Well, and that's why it. those yeah. And that's why those, those policies are in place to help small businesses that's be right. successful to grow. Right. So that's it's not right. like, I want to be really clear to anyone listening. This isn't taking advantage of the system or anything. This is actually oh, no, it is. what's intended no, it is for taking small advantage businesses. of the system, <laughs> but it's still the system. It's not illegal. It's still the I'm system trying to. Yeah. Yes. But let's yeah. be very clear. There's a difference between uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance. I want to avoid taxes, all the taxes without a doubt. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to evade. Well, I do want to evade taxes, but I won't because there's a legal <laughs> ramification there. But tax avoidance, absolutely. I'm going to avoid as many taxes as possible. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely okay with taking advantage of the system. I'm using the system to my advantage. There's no problem with that in my mind. It's very moral, in fact. Uh, yeah. So, And then the other thing I would ask is, do you have any clients that you would be willing to let me speak with? Hmm. And there might be some privacy issues there or something, but there might be some agreements set up that he says, oh yeah, you know, you can call these three or four people, no problem. And you can get those uh, references, but that, that's a handful of questions I would, I would look for and ask. And that might spur some additional questions you should consider as well. For sure. All right, Brett Godfrey, how do you reconcile Romans 13 with choosing not to get a COVID vaccine? And he actually quotes Roman 13 here. Let yeah, everyone be I don't know it. Yeah. Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Uh, second verse, I think. Consequently, however, rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a biblical scholar. So um, I'm just going to give you my, my reference on this. Uh, Number one, there's other verses within the Bible that probably would contradict. And I can't tell you what they are because I'm not a scholar. Yeah. That would contradict that where we have a moral responsibility and obligation to, for example, defend ourselves against uh, unrighteous persecution or something along those lines. You, you, you're sure. probably well, way more versed than I am with biblical stuff. But you can, you can look at even Bible verses that would conflict with what that is. And we have to remember what the Bible is. The Bible is a collection of books. It's not a book. It's a collection of books. And so there's going to be discrepancies between the collection of books. Okay. Well, and, and with context, right? So exactly. It, sure. Right. And, and I think I remember the context of, of, of Romans as a whole. I, if I believe correctly, the, the Christian church was split between Roman Christians and Jewish Christians. And there was an attempt 
to kind of bring them together. So the, the con and this is the problem with the Bible, right? Is we grab a, we grab a verse like this or whatever, without the context of what governing authority is he talking about it? It's critical, right? Like we have to understand the context. Sorry. I mean, another great, here's a, here's a conflicting in the Bible. And again, I'm not a scholar, so I'm going to speak my ignorance here, but you guys are going to understand what I'm saying. There was a decree across the land that all of the firstborn sons were to be executed. And so what did the people do? They hid their sons. Governing authority. Yeah. (laughs) So do you subject, subject yourself to a governing authority? Well, according to Romans in the verse you just read, if you just look at it in that isolated context, that's what you do. You actually give up voluntarily your firstborn son. Okay. So we need to understand, I, I really like that you said context, and this doesn't apply just to the Bible. This applies to everything. If I say uh, on, on Instagram, for example, you know, guys, we should really strive to be good and decent and respect other people. I'll always have some asshole who comes back and says, well, not everybody should get respect. Okay. <laughs> like, clearly, Clearly, there are exceptions to everything that's being said. And I'll say that. I'll say, well, clearly there's an exception. Well, you said everybody. Okay, well, then you're a moron. If you are incapable of discerning a figure of speech and trying to literally translate that and apply it to your life. And I'm not saying the gentleman asking this question is a moron. Like, I think this is a thoughtful question. But we need to remember, like you said, context, and then also consider that there's other Bible verses and passages and phrases and stories that would conflict with what you just said, what Romans just said. So how do you reconcile those? Ask God. That's what you do. You pray and you ask God. Now, there's one other thing I want to say with governing authorities. We have a system in place, a legal system in place to remove those individuals who are not serving and representing us well. In fact, in the constitution, our founding documents, it says we have a obligation, obligation to ignore immoral dominion over us. That's actually part of, in our founding documents, it's it's written, right? You can read it. We We are told to rebel. In our fa- that's law. In our, it's law so much that there's a supreme court. There's a supreme law of the land meant to interpret that constitution. What is and isn't constitutional? We have a moral obligation to reject immoral laws and orders and and these types of things. It's in our founding documents, and also we have a system that allows us to remove those people who need to be removed from office. And this doesn't matter what side of the political aisle. Look, you guys all know I'm conservative. Everybody knows that. And the overwhelming majority of our audience is conservative, but we have uh, those who are liberal that listen, and I'm glad to have them listen as well. Um, so let's take Trump. Look, you, every, every one of us has a, a thought about Trump being impeached. But the fact of the matter is, is that was followed. The system was followed, right? Yeah. So there's systems and there's checks and there's balances built into the equation that allow us to override the the mandates and the rules and the laws and change the law. Like there's systems in place. And so we need to exercise those systems. That's the point I'm making is the systems are already there. And also I can find other Bible verses, passages and stories that would conflict with, I believe you said Romans 13. Yeah. And, and I think to your point, maybe what you're getting at is be an active participant in said systems, right. And who you vote for. And yeah, you know, like actually there's, there are systems in place that give us the ability to change leadership and we should be active participants in those. And if you're not going to do that, don't vote. That's my other, I, yeah. I would Im- implore and don't you not to do that. Then. Yeah. No, I actually, I don't agree with that. Oh, really? I think, yeah, I do. I think we all have a right to point out injustice. It, not only right, right, I think is the baseline, but we have responsibility yeah. to point. People like to say this on Instagram too. Uh, I'll, I'll say something, I'll, I'll point out something I don't like and they'll say, well, you know, just don't complain about it. What are you, what are you talking about? Like if I see something wrong, I actually should point that out. Now to what you're saying is, 
Okay. And then work towards a solution. I know that's what you're saying. Yeah. Take some action. Um, yeah. But I, I don't have any problem with, I, I, I've actually never once said, Hey, if you don't like this country, then leave. I don't think I've ever said that once. Cause I think it's, it's a very rudimentary way of looking at it. I get the sentiment. I, I understand what you're saying. I just don't like that phrase. Cause I, I think the better phrase is if you don't like the system, let's all work together to figure out a better system. But yeah, let's change it. Yeah. But there's, there's things in place. I guess the point I'm making is like, yeah, I, I, I think all of us should be pointing out things that we don't like. And there's things that I don't like that I'm not willing to work on solutions towards because I'm busy with other things that I'm working on solutions towards. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't point it out or bring it up. I think we should. That's okay. But I, I think if you're not going to be, if you're not willing to study and research and get some even base knowledge, then don't vote because that's just acting in ignorance. And that's ridiculous. Mm. All right. Thomas Campbell, what's the difference between doing your best or going above and beyond is above and beyond your best or is the, or is that two separate ideas altogether? I mean, I think you might get into a little bit of semantics here, but you can't do your best and do the bare minimum. Yeah. Right. Kip, if I came to you and I said, Hey, Kip, I want you to do 10 pushups. Is that your, is doing 10 pushups your best? <laughs> no. You could probably do at least 11. I would think. Yeah. At least maybe 11 and a half. <laughs> right. Once I got maybe. to my knees, I could throw in another five, maybe. Also, by the way, there is no half in this. Like there's either <laughs> you did it or you didn't. There's no halves. I did half a push up. No, you either did a push up or you didn't. Like that's the objective <laughs> metric. Right. Um, so your best is, I would think more synonymous with above and beyond. Now there's some situations where I don't think you need to do your best. College is a great example. <laughs> like if I'm going to college, I'm going to try to get eight. I, I, I don't, I personally went to a half a semester of college. I lost my academic scholarship and realized very quickly that was not for me. And I think that's probably the case for 80% of the population. Yeah. But if I was going to college, I would pass all my, all my grades and all my classes to the bare minimum. Cause why beat your head against the wall? if you don't need to, to the bare minimum, or I would, or I would graduate way faster. Like I would get C's and B's and whatnot on get done faster, double yeah. time and do it in half the time. <laughs> and, and oh. I would be okay with that. And so there's situations where doing what is required is okay. I don't yeah. always need to do everything exactly the best way I should do it. But there's other things that I think we should go above and beyond. If I'm going to run an event for fathers and sons, like there's things I could do that would be bare minimum and everybody would be satisfied and that would be, but that's not my goal. Like my goal is to exceed and go above and beyond. And so that's why I do this after action yeah. review. And I have copious notes right here and on my phone about what I need to order and how I need to improve and how we need to work the timeline and all this kind of stuff. So really, I think what you need to do is discern where you need to show up fully and where you need to get a passing grade. Yeah, it's if really intentionality to, around what you're doing and totally priority, right? And yeah. and and contrary to the the popular belief about the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. No, sometimes you know I just need to get through that so I can move on to it. Yeah, totally. Strategy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talking about college, like I I I was working full time and going to school full time, and I would intentionally go, okay, I'm going to this class. I have a good grade in this class. I'm going to sleep, and I would sit in the back of the class. And get my hour rest in so that way I could push through because, and I was consciously like, I am going to do this because I need a rest and I need to sleep and I need to get a nap in because I'm losing my mind, you know? Right. And I was intentional that and I was okay with that. Or the alternative is you were working as well. And so you show up to work. I was, I was delivering pizzas in college. And so, you know, I show up to work. Um, and I used it as an opportunity to be social. I met people when I was delivering pizzas. I met uh, guys and gals there that I worked with. And so I used it as a social element. And if my boss called me on Saturday and said, can you work? Yeah, I could work. Sure. But the answer was no. <laughs> yeah. Because I always yeah. knew I'm delivering pizzas. 
Like I ain't, yeah, I ain't like, doing brain this surgery. This is going to push my career. Yeah. This is how I got to push my career forward. Yeah. So I'm going to show up. I'm going to do what's asked of me. I'm going to hit the schedule. I'm going to get there on time. I'm going to leave on time. I'm going to work hard, do my dishes and whatnot and deliver pizzas to the best of my, like, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to be yeah. doing. But no, I'm not going above and beyond. Why would I do that? Cause I want to go down to the lake yeah. and I want to go skimboarding or I want to go to the beach or I want to go to Lake, Lake Havasu or like any of these other things that I wanted to do in college. And so I deliberately made those decisions and those decisions are acceptable in some cases. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Mark Wood, how do you keep moving on when the high after legacy wears off or the main event or any event when you are around high caliber men and you're constantly getting pumped up from the conversations, activities, and the energy around you? Yeah. So this is where I differ from a lot of the people who are like, oh, motivation sucks and discipline is everything and like that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> I actually think there's a very powerful place for motivation. <laughs> I think, I think if yeah. you're using it as a tactic and strategy to move yourself or move the needle, then why wouldn't you use that? But some guys are like, motivation is lame. Discipline is everything. And <laughs> like, well, why wouldn't you use motivate? Like, so you don't go to any seminars. You don't learn from other people. You don't read a book to get yeah. all hopped up. You don't get, you don't get emotional when you watch a movie. Like you watch Braveheart and you don't like feel like you want to be more of a badass. Okay, well, why'd you watch that then? Right. Like, so there is a time and a place for motivation. So Mark, what I would say, and I appreciated having you guys out here is what I would suggest to you is that you look at ways to recreate what we did. Yeah. So what did we do? Well, we got around other men. Surely there's men in your area. You have men on your battle team within the iron council. What can you guys do to get together? Come back out next year. That's another thing is sometimes we just need a little bit more motivation. Maybe it's an annual motivation. There's events that I go yeah. to every single year and I walk away inspired and motivated and compelled and uplifted and edified. And that's all good. And then I take those practices and then I incorporate the discipline or the structures or the systems or the processes that are going to actually move the needle. So you need both. You need the discipline, which is the process and systems. And then you need the motivation, the inspiration, and both are valuable. Like one isn't more valuable than the other. Both are valuable. When motivation wears off, discipline is going to fall into line. When discipline becomes monotonous and boring and mundane and you feel like quitting, motivation and inspiration comes in. So let's use both of them, the logic and the emotion. Like both are fine. So um, yeah, what I would say is look for ways to recreate what we did through activities, through exercises, and then through other men, and then build in the systems and processes based on what we talked about that will allow you to move into the discipline component until we're able to meet again next year. Or in two weeks in Mark's case, because he's coming back out for the main event. <laughs> Copy. All right. Mike Hansen, a very similar question from before, but I, I like a portion of, of Mike's um, question here, and I think it'd be valuable. So he says, Ryan, I would like to know how you approach sovereignty and submission at God's will. We've kind of already addressed that, but this I, this I think is valuable. It, what do you practice in order to know you are in his will for your life with plans, goals, and your vision? That is more of an intuitive thing for me. Uh, it's not that I, I'm very deliberate and intentional, but I pray to God and I ask for his guidance and direction and I thank him for my blessings. I, I wish I had a, like a more refined yeah. answer, but I pray daily, at least twice a day, often more times than that, just in the spur of the moment. If I'm about to give uh, a presentation, for example, I might just do a quick prayer that, and, and the prayer would probably go something like this. Uh, God, please, please use me as an instrument for your message. Uh, soften the hearts and the minds of the people who will listen to what I have to say and let the words be an accurate depiction of and representation of what you'd want me to share and allow it to impact them in a meaningful and significant way. Amen. Yeah. You know, would that take 20 seconds or it might be an evening prayer where, and, and I wouldn't even like get on my knees and like a formal in that last one. I would, it, it's just like in the moment I'd close my eyes 20 seconds before I'm about to go on stage and that's my prayer. And then I go out and do my thing. And, yeah. and that, that, that leaves me open to promptings and maybe even changing my speech. Maybe I had something listed out, but I actually prayed to use the right words. And so maybe the word that I writ I wrote down wasn't the right word or the story wasn't the right story. And now I'm open to inspiration, divine inspiration that will allow me to tweak what needs to be tweaked. And it'll be way more impactful. I found that to be true. Uh, or it might be something that's structured 
like an evening prayer where, where I will, I will literally get on my knees, fold my arms, bow my head, close my eyes. Sometimes we'll do this as a family at dinner, for example, uh, or before I'm going to bed and I'll honor and recognize God. I'll, I'll thank him for the blessings. Um, I'll ask for anything that I may need help and support and guidance with. Another thing I do when it comes to asking for help is I always approach my prayer, not with only an ask, but here's what I think I should do. You know, I, th I think, for example, I should do this father son event, or I think in this dilemma I'm dealing with, here's the conclusion I've come to. I think this is right. Will you help me understand if that is the case or not? I don't, I very rarely do I say, I need this thing from you. <laughs> It's, it's like, yeah. I try to do my part, which is like, I've researched, I've listened, I've asked other people, I have resources available. And here's the conclusion I've come to, is this right? Uh, and then I ask for blessings for other people who are important. You Kipper on that, the people who are listening to this podcast are in that list, my children, my family, my friends, people I interact with on a daily basis, strangers, uh, missionaries. Uh, our, our, our warriors who serve this nation. Like we, we pray for those people. So that, that might be something more structured. And then I just listen and I ask myself, like, am I doing good? Not good as in like, I need your validation, but am I, am I doing what you want me to do? Am I, am I living the kind of life? Is this right? You know, I might do something in the moment. I'm like, I don't know about this. Is this right? And I might get a no. Okay. Well, I got a pivot in that, or I get a, just a, a, an affirmation of that. You're doing good. Just keep, you're okay. Just keep going. So it's very intuitive for me, but it's also something that I've built into my daily plan and practices so that I can have that level of intuition uh, and, and reflection and making sure that I'm on that path. Now, a lot of guys will say, and I think this might question might allude to this a little bit. will say, well, like, how do I know I'm listening to God and not listening to myself? And I think that has to do with motives. I think that's probably the greatest differentiating factor. If you're listening to God, your motive is to serve others. If you're listening to yourself, your motive is to serve yourself. Yeah. Right. Like if I'm like, well, I could do this thing and I can make a bunch of money. So I'm going to do it. Well, God told me to do it. Yeah. Or I'm going to look good or I'm going to aspire to the honors yes. of men. If I do this, right. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. you know, have power, you know, I think God would say, Hey, if you do this, you're going to reach a lot more people and you're going to impact their lives. Um, well, let me give you an example. Here, here's, a, here's a very interesting example I thought about this morning. My wife and I were talking and I said, you know, hon, I think I'm going to raise the price of the legacy event. And she said, oh, why are you going to do that? And I said, well, you know, first we're going to make more money. And she's like, oh, is it about money? I said, no, it's not about money. But if I raise the price, I can bring three or four powerful, powerful uh, experts in these specific areas that might enhance the, uh, the experience. And she's like, Oh, that's a good idea. You should raise the price. See the difference. It's subtle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like if I rate, cause yeah. the, the answer is still the same, raise the price. That's, that's the interesting thing. The answer, whether I'm listening, whether the motive is to serve others or to serve myself, the answer is the same, raise the price. If yeah. I raise the price, I can make more, I can put more money in my pocket, which is not bad, by the way. Some, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. But if it's, hey, if I raise the price, then I can do these things and people will have a better experience. That's a different motive. That's a more, in my mind, a more pure motive and one that I think people will pick up on and ultimately serve them better. So what is your motive? Mm -hmm. And that's how I think you're going to know whether or not you're listening to yourself or you're listening to a higher power. I like that. I do think Ryan confirm. I mean, obviously I don't want to speak for you, but uh, I mean, there's some base, there's some baselines that I think that, that you have, that that's everything you said is built upon. And it's the idea that, 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 you know, that God's plan is for you to become the best version of yourself, to serve people, to leave a lasting impact in the world. And that your role within a family is like one of the highest priorities. And, and, and a lot, of, and is that one, I don't want to speak with you. One, is that accurate? And then two, that's kind of a baseline that you then operate upon as well, right? Like there's some kind of baseline understanding, I think that you have of, of quote unquote, God's plan that are, are the top priority items. The, um, my, 
I've, I've thought a lot about this. I spend time thinking about this. My sole purpose in life is to serve. I mean, period. That's the, that's the, that is yeah. the word that describes what I want my life to be. Yeah. You know, you Whether take our motto, a father or whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. strangers, like it doesn't matter to serve. So if you take our motto, I used to think our motto, that's clever, right? That's tricky. That's crafty. It's alliteration. You start with three P's. (laughs) It's good, (laughs) but, and it is good. Like it's marketing. I I get marketing. I like marketing. And you know what, if I can mark here, here's an interesting thing. This is going to be very controversial. Uh, When I had Grant Cardone on the podcast years ago, we got talking about similar kind of subjects and he said something. And I, when he said it, I cringed. I was like, Oh, bro, I don't say that. And he said in the classic Grant Cardone way, he said, you know, if Jesus Christ was on the planet right now, he would have a fleet of Gulfstream jets. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, like, why, why do you have to say that? And then I got thinking about it more. And I was yeah. like, no, actually that's probably true. Like he would be, he would have an Instagram. Jesus Christ would have an Instagram account. Wouldn't he? It, if it's a tool to influence and help serve, I don't see why you want to use it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Christ yeah. would have an Instagram account. He would have a fleet of Gulfstream jets. He would be traveling from continent to continent. He would be putting on seminars and events. He would be doing that. That's like, sounds so blasphemous to say, but that's, yeah. and that's what he did with the technology he had available. He walked yeah. from town to town to do the same thing, but with the technology he had 2000 years ago, that was what he was using. Yeah. It sounds so blasphemous, but it's true. It's a hundred percent true. It's a hundred percent accurate. Mm. And so my main objective is to serve. And so I'm going to use technology. I'm going to use marketing. Uh, I'm going to use money. I'm going to make myself more capable. I'm going to develop influence. And so some of this means I have to take care of myself so that I can be more influential so that I can serve more people. But ultimately that is my, that is the one word that describes that just sums up the way I want to live my life is just to yeah. serve people. That's it. So uh, yes, the answer to your question is yes. I, that's right. I just want to serve people. I want to help. That's all I want to do. Love it. Do you have a word? To finish. Do you have something that you would, uh, have you thought about it like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, I think that, that, to have a life of no regret and mm. to feel like I, I could go to my creator and feel like I didn't waste that gift that was granted to me, it would mean that did I make a difference, which is another way of saying the same thing as serve, right? Did I make a difference in the time that was given to me? You know, and and I have to remember, and we've talked about this in the past, but this is something I have to add to that is my ability to make a difference is sometimes to be joyful (laughs) because my default behavior is intense, right? Like I I'm doing a presentation later today for all our employees around ownership. It's going to be intense because I'm always like ownership, you know, like, but guess what? Sometimes that's not fun. And sometimes it needs to be joyful. And sometimes you need to enjoy life along the way. And I have to remind myself that that's also a way to serve on, in regards to how I show up and being impactful, not just through message, but also through pleasantness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have people in my life that I love being around. Why do I love being around them? Cause they're pleasant to be around. You not because they drop some insane knowledge. They're just fun people to be around, yeah. you know, and they lift you up, you know, and I have to remember that part of it. I love it. All right. It's my wife says I do. <laughs> she told me I had to do that. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to she be says, joyous. Please be more enjoyable. pleasant to be around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, All right, brother. All right. Well, cool. We'll bring us home. I think we got through some great questions today. Yeah. I mean, we filled our questions today from the, from the gentleman of the Iron Council to join us there. Please go to orderman.com slash Iron Council to learn more. And of course, uh, you can join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Events are full. Stay tuned for other communications around future events. And of course, to uh, 
get connected and support with us, you could do that through YouTube, the podcast, follow Mr. Mickler on Twitter and Instagram at Ryan Mickler. And of course, uh, supporting the movement by your swag. And you get that swag at store.orderofman.com. Excellent. All right, guys, you got your marching orders. We're going to have dates for you here in the next uh, week or two on the upcoming events in 2022. So stay tuned for that. And until then, go out there, take action and become the man you are meant to be.